Well, good afternoon. I'm Ari Plonsky, the deputy director of the Institute of Advanced Studies. I'm very pleased that you came here Friday afternoon, July. In academy, it's kind of a half a vacation time, which means that we have more mental space to discuss interesting issues, as, such as navigating the storms of our second renaissance. I would uh, like very much to thank first Professor Chris Kutarna from Oxford for being with us, uh, dear uh, Weber Amara, Professor Weber Amarao, our colleague from the Agriculture uh, Engineering School, Luis de Queiroz in Piracicaba, for organizing this very challenging, intellectually challenging, and with practical results, I imagine, too, uh, uh, meeting. And uh, I would like uh, to, if possible, to make just a, a few very brief statements. Um, the first one is that uh, if uh, I understood from the original uh, title that probably attracted you here, uh, the title was New Maps and New Destinations. And the idea was uh, the age of discovery and uh, etc. So what I kind of was impressed is that uh, in, uh, it has to do, your book, Age of Discovery, has to do not only but also with innovations. And that uh, the idea of innovation is kind of connected to the idea of progress, which is something that you go from here to there, but farther on. Kind of. And what uh, we discussed yesterday when we came here is that uh, probably at some point you'll discuss about circular economy, which means that maybe innovation is not only linear in the sense of going from here to a line to the future or to some future, better future supposedly, but maybe innovation can also be kind of circular. So that's, that was one thing that struck my, my mind. The second is that in the beginning of your book, uh, you mentioned that uh, we live in the age of contest between floundering and, uh, and, uh, and you know, furthering. And, uh, and this idea of innovation uh, being part of a contest uh, is obviously part of the game, but uh, it, it connected me to kind of a, maybe a little bit of a pun, but uh, with the idea that the I innovation is also a contested idea. So it's not only a contest, it's also a contested idea. And uh, there is a very interesting book of Professor Benoit Godin from INRS Institute of uh, National Institute of, of Research, which belongs to Quebec University, uh, which he published in 2015, which is exactly uh, innovation contested where he, bring, he begins with uh, classic Greek philosophers and goes up to Chris Freeman, you, you were you, the university where you made your PhD, Sussex, and uh, shows how this idea has been changing during the ages, including the, the Renaissance when it began uh, from being something, uh, uh, a kind of a deviation that uh, made uh, uh, a professor from Oxford, Roger Bacon, to be imprisoned for suspicious innovations, and it became something that he calls at the end this kind of uh, a very well accepted secular heresy, which at that time was a religious heresy and non-welcome, today is a secular heresy, so going against the, the tide. So maybe uh, you'll help us navigate uh, the storms of this Second Renaissance, and I would like again very, very much to thank you, to thank Professor Weber that I'll give him the control of of the meeting. He'll present you. I, 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 as way, Weber, I, I can present you much more. You were so much involved in the issue of sustainability, of center of biofuels you directed. You are anyhow you a very international person, but I think uh, you uh, uh, people know you, and you'll be also participating and people will know more about yourself yourself i would like just to highlight the presence of among other good friends here 
of uh, Professor Marcus Bukirich, who is, uh, besides being a, a member of this institute and uh, uh, in charge of the very important program, which is Institute of Global Cities, he's also the president of the Sao Paulo State Academy of Sciences. And I would like also to recognize the presence of a dear friend, Andres Saito, who is executive director of the Brazilian Society uh, for uh, Knowledge Management, if I can translate it more or less correct. Sociedade Brasileira de Gestão do Conhecimento. So, uh, please, all you, of you, be welcome. Weber, the floor is yours. Well, the floor is ours, right? Uh, it's not um, mine or Chris. So, again, I would like to... Uh, Thank Professor uh, Plonsky for uh, hosting us here. He has been very generous on, on uh, providing this environment for us to start thinking and discussing um, new pathways, new maps, and new ways of moving towards next steps. Uh, again, it's my pleasure to host Chris here for the first time. We've met in a conference at Oxford, um, and I said, look, we, uh, somehow we have to find uh, ways of bringing him here. So he came, he accepted, so he came. Uh, he just arrived, uh, almost, uh, and this morning we, um, we had a very interesting discussions on the linkages between um, uh, this new renaissance and climate change, trying to make bridges ab about the complexities uh, that we're facing now, they're relieving. So we had a great talk and uh, and uh, we grinded Chris for almost four hours, so I hope uh, he will still have the stamina to continue to be grinded here by, by you guys and by the other ones that are watching. Again, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Chris. Um, uh, Chris has been um, working on this, um, let's say, pathways <laughs> towards understanding of uh, or using history to understand the future. Uh, had written a seminal book, uh, he will share about this, and he's um, a fellow at Martin's, uh, Oxford Martin School, uh, a leading, I would say, speaker of different forum, and I'm sure that uh, we'll be pleased to have um, uh, some of his thoughts and share it with us. And finally, uh, we are live, so for those who are watching us, uh, we have the videos. Uh, if we would like to ask questions, uh, please ask. We'll get, pass the mic, so then we'll, we could tape you. Um, and then uh, we have um, questions. If you are, um, have questions, please uh, send um, uh, an email to uh, iearesponde at usp.br. So iearesponde at usp.br. Uh, I'm changing from Portuguese and English. I hope all those guys are uh, watching us are will listen to uh, to what we're saying in Portuguese. Ia responde arroba So uh, we'll no no further ado. Please, uh, Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much, Professor Plomsky, for the invitation, for hosting me. Uh, it's an honor to be here at the IEA. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Professor Marcus, honor to meet you, everyone here at Weber. Thank you so much for the invitation uh, to be here today. Uh, hello to everyone online. <laughs> uh, please bear with me. I'm just getting over a cold, uh, so if you hear that in my voice, that's why I, I tried to get rid of it as best I could, but it decided to hang around for a while. Um, it's, this is my first time uh, visiting Brazil, and I, I just can't imagine uh, a better way uh, to begin my Brazilian experience than the day that I'm spending here at, uh, at the University of Sao Paulo. So thank you all, everyone, for, for making that possible and, and for joining me here uh, on a Friday afternoon in the middle of the winter, although being Canadian, I have to say that my definition of winter... Um, yeah, it, if you want... You, you come visit me, and I will explain winter to you. <laughs> this is not winter. <laughs> this, is, this is the height of summer. It's wonderful to be here. Um, and maybe because it's, you know, it's holiday time, <clears throat> because it's a Friday afternoon, uh, if you'll permit me, uh, I want to be a little less formal with uh, my presentation today uh, than I normally am in an academic setting. Uh, you know, sort of let my hair down a little bit, uh, and just, just 
explore a little more broadly um, the time that we live in, uh, the challenges we face, um, how to make sense of it, you know, the maps that we navigate by today, uh, and maybe the new maps that, that we need to, to navigate tomorrow. So I'm basically asking for permission to, uh, to say some controversial things from time to time that I can't necessarily support with data, but that I hope will be provocative and allow us to have a great conversation. <clears throat> and uh, I want to begin with a story. Uh, and it's a story uh, about a technology that has transformed civilization. Uh, and it's a technology that began simply, uh, began humbly, uh, simply as a way for a few experts to exchange information. Right? Um, but very quickly, other people discovered that, hey, uh, this technology is useful for a lot of things that, that the original users never intended. Right? And as this technology spread, it became smaller, cheaper, and faster, until suddenly it was everywhere. And it became this new medium through which we all communicate, uh, exchange, store information every day. Um, you know, it, this new medium, it came into our lives so fast that parents who grew up having never seen this new medium, uh, have children for whom it's just a completely ordinary part of their daily lives. Uh, and it's led one philosopher of history to argue that you know, we can hardly report an invention of, of like importance for humanity, uh, whether we're talking about ancient times or modern times. And that, of course, was the head librarian of the Vatican <laughs> in 1470. <clears throat> because, of course, the story that I've been telling you is the story of the printing press, of print, which uh, this man, Bisheng, invented in the Song Dynasty in the 10th century. Uh, and then this man, Gutenberg, uh, reinvented uh, in Europe about 500 years later. And, you know, like our digital medium today, the defining feature, one of the defining features of print was how quickly it spread. So Gutenberg developed the first printing press in the 1450s in Mainz in Germany, and by 1500, uh, the printing presses dotted Europe. Right? Somewhere between 20 and 100 million books were printed in the first 50 years of this technology. We don't know exactly how many. Um, but so that 2,000 years worth of accumulated Western knowledge were duplicated in that first 50 years of print. And then that total doubled over the next 25 years. So that knowledge production in Western civilization went from gradual to exponential. Sound familiar? <laughs> right. Which brings us to the here and now. Or equally, the here and the now. <clears throat> this is a, a very famous photograph called Pale Blue Dot. It was taken by uh, the Voyager 1 spacecraft in 1990 uh, from a distance of about 6 billion kilometers. And that's us, right there. See, the challenge that we face today, I think one of the big challenges, is figuring out what, what perspective to have on our world in order to make sense of it. Because we seem to live in this time uh, of shock, right? I mean, it seems that if there is one constant in our lives right now, uh, it is shock events. Whether they are uh, you know, economic shocks, like the financial crisis, uh, 
or you know, sudden collapse in oil prices, commodity prices, um, business shocks like the, the retail revolution, uh, of Amazon. You know, Amazon is a company whose uh, stock price has doubled in the last year alone, uh, even as it puts millions of, of retailers out of business. Um, just out of curiosity, did anyone here buy Amazon stock when it went IPO in 1997? You did? You didn't? No. Anyone? No. I mean, we're not in it for the money anyway, but it'd be interesting if you had. Um, you know, shocks in science and technology, like synthetic biology, uh, like artificial engineering, uh, sorry, artificial intelligence. Um, just a month ago, Google's AlphaGo beat the, you're nodding your head, beat the world Go champion, Kudzia. I think it was in Shanghai. And this was like a, it was like a retelling of a story from the 1990s when IBM's Deep Blue beat uh, the world chess champion, Garry Kasparov. Right? And at that time we said, well, chess is one game, right? that we can build algorithms to defeat a human player. But a game like Go is so fluid, so intuitive, it'd be very difficult to build an algorithm that could ever beat a human Go expert. And then 20 years later, we managed to cross that threshold. That happened this year. Um, and then, you know, shocks to uh, our communities, uh, to our personal security. I live in the UK, and if you just think for a moment about uh, the kind of uh, security shocks uh, that the UK has experienced in, in, you know, just this year alone, with, uh, you know, terrorist attacks in, in Manchester, uh, then there was London Bridge, um, about a month ago, Finsbury Park, the bombing of a mosque. Uh, I actually live two blocks away from that mosque, so you know it's it's coming very close to home. And then, of course, you know there have been these headline political shocks uh, of the last year: uh, Britain's referendum to exit the EU, uh, and then maybe the biggest shock <laughs> of them all. Right? And you know sometimes it seems that with every shock. What's happened in popular discourse is that our perspective has become narrower and narrower and narrower until suddenly now all we can talk about is the last shock in front of our face. Right? And that's a challenge. It's hard to make sense of things. It's hard to even see clearly, you know, when all I see is this, this shock in front of my face. Right? And so somehow we need to find this way to, to step back the world starts to make more sense. You know, what's relevant starts to come into focus when we can step back uh, and find a helpful perspective. Right? Now, my perspective uh, for the last couple of years, um, my hallucination <laughs> is that we're living in uh, a second renaissance. So I'm gathering my perspective uh, from history. And, and by renaissance, you know, I think it's important to say, I don't mean that this is some uh, golden age right, of uh, you know, universal uh, beauty and truth. Um, for some people, that's a, maybe a popular notion of what the renaissance was, but that's not, well, first of all, I don't think anyone would believe that that's the kind of moment we're in today. Um, but that's also not the kind of moment that the 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 Renaissance in Europe 500 years ago was. Uh, it was uh, a deeply contested moment. Right? Well, wh and so maybe let me start there with just a little bit of history. What is a Renaissance moment then? Well, I think it's a couple of things. Um, first, as I mentioned sort of in my intro story, uh, it's a time of new media. Right? So Gutenberg, Zuckerberg, right? <laughs> print as a new medium and digital as a new medium. Although it's important, you know, when we make that comparison to recognize that there's a real difference of scale between these two information revolutions. Uh, in fact, if you compare the impact of the print revolution upon humanity's information resources to something like 
you know, the lighting of a single candle in the middle of a dark night, then our digital revolution, compared to that candle, is like the sunrise. And that's not just pretty poetry. I hope, I hope you think that's pretty poetry. I wrote that myself. Um, but if you do the math, it's literally true in terms of the inflation and in information resources achieved through print and achieved through our digital revolution. It's about similar in scale to you know, one candle to the output of the sun. Right? So there's a massive scale difference between, you know, if you will, the, the first renaissance and the second when it comes to this idea of new media. The second characteristic of a, a renaissance moment, I think then and now, uh, is new maps. So uh, in the 1450s, before the, the European voyages of discovery, uh, this was the best map of the world that Europe had access to. And it was made by uh, the Greek Ptolemy in the second century AD. And, and we look at it today and say, you know, there's a lot that is incorrect here. Uh, the body of water, in the bottom right corner, that's the Indian Ocean, which Greece, ancient Greece and Europe up until the 15th century thought was landlocked. Uh, the landmass in the lower left, that's Africa, which had no southern tip as far as Europe knew. Uh, and of course, the Americas, you know, where we are today, they didn't exist at all in European consciousness. Right? But within 50 years, 75 years, uh, the so-called voyages of discovery, uh, Vasco da Gama, Ferdinand Magellan, you know, Christopher Columbus, right, made, made this map possible. Uh, this is Mercator's 1569 map of the world. Um, and with a few modifications, we sort of filled in the Americas and we added Australia. Uh, this is still the, the basic template for uh, many world maps today. Um, and it wasn't just new maps, I mean, the, the discovery uh, that you know, these oceans, like the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific, could be navigated, made new flows possible. Right? There was flow of people in the form of uh, mass slavery from Africa to the Americas. You know, there was a flow of goods, like tobacco and sugar, from the Americas. To Europe. There's a flow of silver from the Americas to Asia to pay for Asian spices and silks that were then sent to Europe. 500 years ago, these, these voyages of discovery put the, the world's precious resources, as people understood them 500 years ago, uh, into truly global motion for the very first time. It was our first globalization. So new media, new maps. And what were the consequences of, of living through this moment, new map, new media, 500 years ago? Well, there was one bright side and a dark side. Right? And the bright side is maybe uh, the implications that we remember best today. Right? This was a time uh, when, in Europe at least, genius flourished. This was a century in which um, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, Nikolai Copernicus, Michelangelo, Machiavelli, you know, they, they coexisted and, and they co-created you know, not just uh, incremental changes in their disciplines, but, but real paradigm shifts in art and science and moral philosophy. So that historians look back on this century as a moment when Western civilization shifted from the medieval to the early modern world. But there was this whole other side, maybe a side that we don't remember as well, uh, certainly not in Europe, North America, uh, which was the flourishing of risk. So Columbus discovers the Americas, and, and new pandemics begin to exchange in both directions across the now connected Atlantic. Uh, economic shocks. Um, so this was Venice. I guess it still is Venice today. <laughs> in, in the 1490s, Venice was the wealthiest place on earth in per capita terms. Um, largely thanks to its control with Genoa of uh, the Mediterranean end of the Asian spice and silk trade. Uh, 
Um, but in about 1497, Vasco da Gama for Portugal, he discovers that, you know, we thought the Indian Ocean was landlocked. It turns out that we can sail around the southern tip of Africa and actually sail into the Indian Ocean. So suddenly now we've discovered a whole new supply chain to those Asian spices, which is the sea route. Right? And as trade volumes began to shift to this um, Indian Ocean supply chain, there was a long decline and collapse all along the old Silk Roads. Um, and one statistic I like to share to, to make it clear, if, if you were a spice merchant in Venice, the year after Portugal discovered its sea route, the price of your product in Venice fell by 50%. Because everyone was expecting that prices were going to be cheaper on the Atlantic coast. And they hadn't done anything wrong, they hadn't changed anything. But the whole economic center of gravity was starting to shift in Europe from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. The first Renaissance was also a time of political shock. As you know, revolutions in science and society opened up these gaps, these institutional gaps, because institutions evolved far more slowly. So 500 years ago this year, Martin Luther nails his 99 theses against indulgences to a church door in Germany. Uh, and he launches an event that we still remember today as the Protestant Reformation. Right? And his protest against a, a faraway church bureaucracy that seemed to penetrate every aspect of people's personal lives, uh, against an institution that was supposed to serve the people but often seemed uh, just to serve itself, his protest in itself wasn't new. There had always been uh, monks, priests, individuals who had agitated against the Catholic Church. What was new was that this time, the theses that he nailed up were taken down, and they were printed. And they were distributed farther and faster than, than Martin Luther expected, that certainly the church expected. It made it possible to coordinate uh, a mass social movement and political movement against the Catholic Church that ultimately caused its breakup. But this was also a moment uh, when populist politicians seized power from long-standing elites. Um, and not just on the margins of society, right? in the heart of Renaissance Europe. So in Florence, which in many ways was the heart, certainly of the artistic Renaissance, uh, this man, Savonarola, was a monk, and he stoked popular anger against an elite, the Medici, that were widely seen as weak and corrupt and not capable of leading the city through the challenges that they faced in this rapidly changing world. He gave a sermon one day in a church. He said, oh, Florence, Florence, your cup is full of holes. But follow me, and I will make this city richer, more powerful, more glorious than she has ever been. I will make Florence great again. He didn't say that last part, but, <laughs> but he, boy, he would have. If, he, if they would have had ball caps 500 years ago. <laughs> that's right, that's right. He ignited a popular revolution too. We still remember it today as the, the bonfire of the vanities, right? Which was a, a symbolic act to reject these new ideas that were challenging traditional values, uh, to eject the Medici from their rulership of the city and, and to install himself as de facto king. As an interesting historical footnote, uh, Savonarola was crucified exactly four years later. But perhaps the parallels end there. So when I say that we're living in a, a Renaissance moment, I mean a moment of, of flourishing genius and flourishing risk. Uh, 
I mean a moment where it's really a kind of a contest for the future when, when the stakes are highest. I think that's a good metaphor for the moment we're in now, the opportunities uh, and the anxiety uh, that we feel. So, you know, when we take off our academic hats and just think broadly about how do we make sense of, uh, of the time that we're living in, uh, I encourage you to, to join me and, and spend some time in, in this hallucination <laughs> uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think that, that through a, a Renaissance lens, um, we can start to set expectations that are more closely aligned to what's actually happening in the world. So, give an example. Uh, last year, I spent most of, uh, most of June and July explaining to Canadian audiences why I had predicted Brexit. And then I spent most of November and December explaining to uh, my colleagues at Oxford uh, why I had predicted that Trump would win the, the US presidency. And I mean, to us in the room, it, it's obvious, right? Because while everyone else was hallucinating that we're living in a business as usual moment, right, we were hallucinating something different, right? We were asking ourselves, you know, well, who is our bonfire of vanity you know, going to be, right? Uh, where is our, you know, Protestant Reformation? Where is our breakup of some institution that we take for granted as a permanent feature on the political landscape? Where is that going to be? And it starts to become very clear that we shouldn't be shocked by these uh, political disruptions. Uh, rather, we should, we should be looking out for them and recognizing the fragility of, of so many aspects of society today and working at making it stronger. So one, I think that it's, it's actually a helpful lens to, to adjust our expectations for the time that we live in. Um, but two, I think that there's also a lot of wisdom to be drawn from history especially when we go through times of, of rapid change, of disruption. Um, because remember, I mean, for, you know, the legacy of, of the European Renaissance is very mixed, and uh, parts of it are very ugly. Uh, parts of it are very beautiful, you know, and we still celebrate them 500 years later. Uh, and so I believe that there is real wisdom lying there for us to look to how humanity going through a broadly similar moment, responded. How does human nature respond in a time like this? Uh, and I don't believe that uh, history holds answers. I don't think it's that easy. But I think that history does pose good questions. Uh, and I really think that the, the seed of wisdom is, is knowing what are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Right? And I think that's where the historical renaissance, the first renaissance, can be very helpful as we think about trying to navigate the second. Um, so let me offer uh, three questions that I think uh, the historical renaissance uh, invites us to ask today. And the first is, um, do we welcome genius in our society? And maybe it sounds like an odd question. Of course we welcome genius. Genius is a good thing. And, you know, the more, the better, right? Well, history suggests that we have a far more uneven relationship uh, with genius than that. Right? So take Copernicus, for example. You know, 500 years ago, when Copernicus said, you know, hey everyone, I think we've got our map of the universe backwards. I think actually that the sun is the center of the universe, not the earth. Right? Was the popular response, oh great, thank you, Copernicus, you're right. Thank you for challenging you know, the beliefs that we've been holding for a thousand years. Thank you for challenging the Bible 
Thank you for challenging the authority of God. Of course, we accept your version of reality. No, of course. Of course not. That was not the response. And <coughs> by the way, did they read his research? Did they read his book? No. They didn't have to. People only had to know what authority is Copernicus challenging in order to know that he was wrong. Right. Now, of course, today, we're far more scientific. Right? We're far more welcoming of the role of technology in our thinking and decision making. Uh, I mean, take our, our phones, for example. Right? You know, as soon as the newest phone comes out, if we can, we all rush and buy the newest gadget because right? it makes our lives better. Uh, I'm a bad example. I actually just have an iPhone 6, but I'm sure there are iPhone 6s and 7s in the room and online. But I think that we, too, have a, have a more mixed record uh, of interacting with, with genius. And you know, we don't have to look any further than you know, some of the research that's going on right here in the university. So take uh, artificial intelligence, for example. Take uh, synthetic biology. You know, take you know, geoengineering. And just like... Copernicus, these fields of research, they're, in a way, trying to take powers that, that once belonged uh, just to God right? and to put them into human hands. At any rate, they're trying to take powers that we've never possessed and suddenly put them into our hands. And it, is there resistance to these lines of research? Yeah. Yeah, there is. And, and some of it with good reason. I mean, you look at a lot of this, there's a lot more uh, effort being put into how do we make these technologies stronger right now than uh, understanding the risks that they present, researching how do we make these technologies safer. But the other issue is that you know, a lot of the resistance to these technological researches, you know, we're not informing our opinions. We don't need to inform our opinions. We only need to know what authority is being challenged by these researchers to know what our position is vis-a-vis -vis these technologies. Right? And, and that's the challenge, especially the broad social challenge. You know, uninformed opinions on technology, for or against, are not going to help to build healthy roles for these technologies in society. So to welcome genius, we really need to be informing ourselves about these researchers. The other, maybe more simple, um, piece of wisdom from uh, the first Renaissance and welcoming genius is, of course, to welcome genius, uh, we need to welcome failure. We need to develop a high level of uh, tolerance within our own lives, within our communities, universities, society, for failure. Um, because genius fails often. Uh, this is uh, a sketch of uh, a flying machine by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, it does not fly. <laughs> this is another sketch for a flying machine uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, it does not fly. <laughs> Anyone want to guess what this is? <laughs> and it doesn't fly. Right? So, you know, 500 years later, uh, you know, Leonardo da Vinci is celebrated for his ingenuity, for his engineering, for his art. Uh, and here's a man who tried his whole life and failed to invent a flying machine. Right? So it's important for us to remember that, you know, the people who are failing often, those are the people that sometimes we need to support in our organizations, in our research, um, because they're also the ones most likely to take the risks to find right, the new pathways forward. So that's one. I think that there's this real powerful urgency from history about examining our relationship to genius in society. Um, I think the second question that um, the Renaissance invites us to ask is where 
are we doing our work? It's interesting, you know, if you wanted to be um, on the forefront of art uh, 500 years ago in Europe, you had to get yourself to this city, Florence. This one city produced more famous Renaissance artists than the rest of Europe combined. It was pretty extraordinary if you think about it. And, and kind of odd, right? Because uh, artists in, you know, 500 years ago in Europe, they lived at the advent of print, right? They lived in this age when it was possible to, to see sort of what was happening in the world of art from kind of anywhere. Right? And today we live in a world where it seems possible to learn to do anything from, from anywhere. Right? So one would be forgiven for thinking that place is less important than it ever has been before. But I want to argue that the opposite is true. Uh, that actually for, for us doing research, doing discovery, uh, where we choose to spend some time is, is one of the most important questions uh, we can ask ourselves. Um, and that's because online we can find the answers to almost any question now, except maybe uh, from a research perspective, from a discovery perspective, the one most important question, which I think is, how did you do that? That's the one question that you can't find the answer to online. See, and it's because, I think basically, there are two types of knowledge. One is uh, explicit knowledge. You know, and explicit knowledge, uh, it can be digitized, to text or video or voice, and once it can be digitized, then it can be shared everywhere easily. But then there's another type of knowledge called tacit knowledge, implicit knowledge. And that's the stuff that's hard to capture. And because it's hard to capture, it's hard to share. But it turns out that this how-to knowledge is really, really important to accelerating discovery. You know? So, um, you know, I like to give uh, one example from my Oxford uh, doctoral studies days. Um, so uh, I have a, a very good friend, and he's now, uh, he's now back in Mexico uh, running an oncology research unit. Jorge, Jorge, great guy. Um, you know, hardcore Metallica fan. Daredevil skateboarder, uh, and just happens to be a, a world-class cancer researcher. <coughs> so I'm interested in cancer research, and so one Friday, uh, I visited his uh, his lab. That's actually, I think I have there's a picture of me and Jorge. Uh, I don't remember what we were doing the the night before, um, but uh, yeah, it must have been good fun. Um, so I visited his lab. And it was one of those uh, lunches, I'm going to get a prop for myself. It was one of those lunches where uh, everybody sat around the table and they presented uh, what they were working on. Right? And so there was a new PhD student there and, and he was keen, so he had a sheet of paper. He had it printed out, you know, here's my research proposal, this is what I'm doing, and here are all of the, um, all of the tests I'm going to run over the next year to uh, isolate and understand uh, what's going on here. And so I remember so clearly, Jorge, he picks up this piece of paper and he kind of looks at it, and, you know, turns it around, he's having fun with the guy. And, uh, and finally he put it down and said, you know, if it were me, I would start with number 17 on your list, right? Because and then he went off and gave this explanation. I, you know, I, I, it was all over my head. But this young PhD student, he's nodding and listening. He's like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I'm going to do that. Anyone know how the story ended? So a month later, Jorge and I are at dining room. Turns out Jorge was right. right. Number 17, that was the variable that mattered. And by getting that kid to start with the right answer, saved him 
a year of work, you know, saved the lab $100,000 in research expenses, cancer research is expensive, right? and also meant that we could just get on that much faster with solving the next problem. And I think if we look at the data, that this kind of help, the role of intuition, of tacit knowledge, is everywhere in creative spaces. And the more complex the domain of research, the more impactful it can be. So what does that mean? I think it means, you know, for us as individual researchers, we have to think hard about where are the deep pools of that kind of intuition in the kind of research I'm doing. Because if I can be in a deep pool, it's going to accelerate my work. Right? For, for program directors, for policymakers, it's about you know, how can we create these deep pools of tacit knowledge right? so that all the activity that takes place there can benefit from the sharing of knowledge that we cannot yet digitize. Jorge couldn't digitize how his hunch, all of his experiences said, that's where you need to begin. Right? And on the frontiers of so much of our research, you know, this key insights, none of us have written down. So you've got to go to where they are to find that help. So I think that's maybe a, a very, very practical insight, a very practical question that uh, Europe from 500 years ago invites us to ask. And then I think the, the third question that I'll end on is uh, what are the maps that we're navigating by? And given all the change that's happening in our domain, or in the world today, uh, are these maps still valid? If you think about it in, in the big picture, uh, that's a lot of uh, what the transformations that the historians look at, how we move from medieval to early modern world. What a lot of these transformations were about was, was making new maps. Right? Uh, and I began already mentioned to you how, how you know, physical maps of the world literally changed. Um, actually, I, I said that this is the best map that Europe had access to, sort of in the 1450s. Um, but you know, very few people in Europe at that time even understood this much about the world. Right? Uh, if, they, if people had any notion of what the world looked like, uh, it was probably something more like this, uh, which is completely makes no sense to modern eyes. Um, but that weird Y-shaped body of water at the bottom, that's the Mediterranean. Uh, the center of the map, was Jerusalem, obviously. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, what else would the center of the world be but Jerusalem? Uh, and, and the top of the map is east. Right? Again, obviously, because the sun rises in the east. I mean, if you were to make a map of the world, how else? How, what else would you put at the top but the source of the sun? Right? And then monsters all along the margins. So really, you know, going from this map to this map was so much more than simply collating all of the data, collecting all the data from the voyages of discovery that were taking place. The real big change in people's mental maps was where we looked for truth. Right? Did we look uh, to the ancients, to the Bible, to revelation here, or do we look to present day observation? And that was the important shift that began in European civilization at that point and laid the groundwork for an eventual you know, scientific enlightenment. Artists, you know, 500 years ago, they didn't just make pretty stuff. Right? They they changed Europe's mental maps about what art was for. You know, what role does art play in society? From uh, the faithful reproduction of a sacred story to creatively reinterpreting 
those stories uh, as the artists uniquely experience them. Right? So, and, you know, for us academics, so pre-Renaissance, plagiarism was a good thing. Right? Plagiarism meant that you were being faithful to the story. Right? To, to depart from the story and do something new, that was, that was heresy. Who are you to change the story? Right? But after the Renaissance, plagiarism meant that you were failing to contribute right? something unique. <coughs> and then, of course, uh, you know, people had to make new maps in their economies. So I mentioned Venice. Um, you know, once their spice trade collapsed, uh, you know, merchants had basically two choices. One was to move to the Atlantic, where the spice trade was moving, and a lot of people did that. Um, other merchants said, well, hold on. You know, our competitive advantage actually isn't our spice monopoly. Uh, our competitive advantage is uh, our business acumen, our advanced banking industry, uh, our craftsmanship. And based on that belief, based on that mental map, I started to pivot Venice into new industries like uh, glass making, fine manufacturers, shipbuilding, uh, and this whole new industry called print. Very interesting that, you know, as best as we can see the economic data, there's not great historical economic data from 500 years ago to really make accurate comparisons. But as best we can tell, 75 years after Venice lost its spice monopoly, Venice was still the richest city in the world in per capita terms as it pivoted into these new industries. <clears throat> so what about us today? So what might be the new maps that, that we need to make? I think one of the big ones is going to be uh, rethinking what progress is, what prosperity is, which is something that Thomas More tried to do in 1517 with his book Utopia. Uh, he just brought the, coined the phrase and brought it into uh, public consciousness, this idea that maybe the way that we're thinking about society today isn't the way to move society forward. It's very interesting. You know, 500 years ago, I've said it now a couple of times, that for contemporary historians, we look back at that period in Europe from 1450 to 1550 as, as pretty fundamental for Western civilization, as a shift in epoch from one era to another. But if you ask a contemporary growth economist, a growth economist today, to look back at that same period, nothing happened. Okay. So here's uh, global GDP per capita for the last thousand years. Right. Here roughly is uh, this so-called renaissance, this so-called age of discovery with all of this flourishing of genius and this flourishing of risk. So show it to me. I, I don't see anything happening here. I don't see anything happening here until the Industrial Revolution. In my worldview, in what I count that matters. And what's interesting is that uh, a lot of people who lived through this so-called Renaissance, uh, they actually felt similarly. So, you know, this man, Christopher Columbus, you know, you know, discovers, it's a horrible phrase, but discovers the Americas. Um, he died thinking that he had found Asia, actually, right? And, uh, and a lot of people who know that he hadn't, because he hadn't found any spices, there were no silks here, it was kind of a non-event for several years. I mean, you know, what is the economic value of the lands that you've discovered, Christopher Columbus? It's not very good, right? Um, so it was, it was a non-event for many people for many years. Um, you know, Gutenberg with his printing press, 17 years ago, remember Y2K, year 2000, and it was very uh, popular in popular media to sort of look back on the last thousand years and you know, what were the, the most important inventions 
of the previous millennium. And the printing press was the top of most people's lists. But what was interesting is that Gutenberg himself, he went bankrupt. Why? Because he could not find a use for the printing press. And the problem was that the setup costs are really high. You want to print a book? I need to individually make every letter. It's like 3,000 letters a page. And then lay them out and then, you know, print them onto this paper. It's a really labor-intensive process. It only makes sense if we can make like 500 copies of this book. The problem in 1450s is that a book is a luxury object. You know, a, a popular book, you know, 10 copies, it's great. We don't, just don't need that many copies of a book. Not that many people read, for God's sake, right? And no one could think of any book that could possibly command volumes in, in the hundreds. And interestingly, the Bible, and we think, oh, okay, obviously what, you know, what he came up with was the Bible. But the Bible didn't save Gutenberg, right? Because in the 1450s, right, the Bible was still a, a specialist text, right? You had to be a priest to read it. It was very unsafe for someone without the popular training to pick up this book. You needed to be able to interpret it safely. It wasn't until the 1510s, the 1520s, when Martin Luther comes around with this wild new idea, we all need to read the Bible for ourselves, that it became a book that everyone in Europe started to feel like, oh, I need to learn how to read this book. Right. So the printing press, you know, eh, in the first 20, 30 years, it took off, but not soon enough for Gutenberg. Uh, so, you know, I feel like we face the same challenge today, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our technological transformations, our social, economic transformations and trying to understand uh, what is their impact. Um, and we can be uh, growth economists and we can say that nothing's happening. In fact, worse than nothing. Productivity is slowing down, innovation is slowing down, GDP growth is slowing down across most of the advanced economies. Or we can be historians and argue that the transformations underway are so deep and fundamental that our old tools for measuring progress are now obsolete. And we need to find a new way of measuring our prosperity. And if it's not at all clear, uh, I prefer the, the red book. <laughs> I recommend it. It's a great read. <laughs> so, uh, I guess by way of conclusion, this is the moment we're in. You know, this storm, uh, this contest for our future. I, I really do think this is, this is an urgent moment of contest. Uh, and ultimately, I think that it's a contest of ideas. Right? Because... Is there a new world beyond this storm? Right? No one's ever seen it. So do you believe that there is one? And if so, right, in which direction? Right? It's a contest for ideas. And, uh, and you know, I, it's not at all clear uh, who's going to win this contest. Um, you know, by way of... Uh, Sobering counterbalance to, admittedly, and I apologize, the very Eurocentric story I've been telling so far. Um, you know, let's think about uh, the Emperor Montezuma, the Aztecs. Right? And this is, uh, so Cortez coming and meeting Montezuma. And there's, uh, there's a wonderful thing about history is that there's so much stuff written down. Um, so there was a Franciscan monk uh, and I forget his name off the top of my head, who, who wrote about the encounter between Cortez and Montezuma from first-hound accounts. He wrote, it, he wrote it down about eight years after it had taken place. 
And there's one chapter where he describes how, how Montezuma sent his sorcerers to cast a spell against, against the, the, the invaders. And when the sorcerers fail, he, he sent a second group of, of high priests and, and soothsayers to cast a curse right, against the conquistadors. Right? But their spells failed. Right? They could not reach the, these newcomers. Right? And we kind of laugh and say, well, you know, of course, because magic isn't real. Right? And curses aren't real. But, you know, 500 years ago, if we're members of the Aztec civilization, they were real for us. If, if Weber is a spellcaster and he curses me, one, Weber knows that I've been cursed. I know that I've been cursed. And, and we all saw it. So we know that, that Chris has been cursed. It is as real a part of our, of our shared social reality as, as me standing up and saying, my name is Chris. It was real for us. You know, so today, <clears throat> you know, when I'm back uh, at Oxford in the UK um, and against uh, sort of, um, there's, some, there's some real anti-immigrant xenophobia uh, right now in the UK. Uh, and so I might, you know, cast a fact that immigrants contribute 15 billion more pounds per year to the public purse than they withdraw in social benefits. Um, or when I go back home to Canada, to Saskatchewan, there's a lot of climate change deniers uh, in, uh, in the agricultural belt in Saskatchewan. You know, I might cast a fact right, that wheat production falls 5 to 10% with every one degree increase in, in global average temperature. And, and my facts fail. Right? They can't cross over into this new culture that has entered, right? And, and, and we're not ordinary fact casters, right? You know, we're high priests. You know, we're the academics of this new, we're the high priests of new, right? I was anointed at the holy altar of Oxford University itself, right? And, and, and my facts fail. Right? And I'm worried for, for what that means. I'm worried about what the consequences of this clash in, in epistemic realities in epistemic cultures might be. But I take a bit of courage um, from the artistic legacy of, uh, of 500 years ago, of the European Renaissance experience. Because a lot of the artists, like Leonardo and Michelangelo, um, they saw this contest of ideas. Um, this is uh, Leonardo's Vitruvian Man. And the square, four corners, four seasons, is earth. Right? And the perfect circle is heaven. And by putting humanity in the center of both, Leonardo was saying that this is a moment where we are free to choose through our actions. We can either rise to the angels or we can descend to the beasts. You know, it's up to us. Um, there was also the basic message behind Michelangelo's David. What was famous about Michelangelo's David is that really for the first time in the history of representing the story, David and Goliath, David is drawn by himself. David is carved alone. And always the classic portrayal was, you know, Goliath is dead on the ground, you know, David stands victorious, Sort of, you know, a severed head in one hand and, you know, a sword in the other. Right? The moment of victory. And by carving David alone, you know, looking tense, his eyes focusing forward, you know, Michelangelo was telling his audience that we haven't yet reached our moment of victory. We live in this moment of contest. This contest of ideas. Right? And, and it's up to us to recognize this moment of choice and, and to choose, you know, to exercise the power of choice. How are we going to be, us Florentines, right, in, in this moment of change and shock? 
and his audience 500 years ago, they knew that moment. They knew that they were in it. And I think that we are in it too. And Goliath is waiting. So thank you very much. I guess we have uh, a lot of uh, food for thoughts and uh, in our uh, ways uh, towards um, new thinking of the momentum that we're living, uh, the complexities, uncertainties, risks. And I would like to um, ask you uh, guys uh, your thoughts uh, and if you have um, some challenges uh, that you would like to pose to Chris. Uh, and then I will come also to discuss a few other issues, especially around uh, developmental pathways and ways in which the, where we're going to in the future. So, but I will leave to the audience some of uh, the thoughts and uh, questions. I'll just start shooting. Uh, uh, ma yes, Marco, Marcus Buckridge, uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies. Um, we didn't, uh, we perhaps three questions. You are assuming that history go, goes by transition, it's not linear, right? So you, you have, it, it stays there and then you have uh, uh, revolutions uh, and we are now in the boat in the middle of one of them. Mm. Uh, just confirm or comment. Uh, the other thing is in, in the Renaissance we, we couldn't say we really had science, right? We, we, science did not exist. So people saw the world in a completely different way. Maybe art was, uh, the art that you show it in Florence was their science, was the, the lens through, through which they, they, they saw the world. Uh, do you think that we are living now in a moment that we are seeing the world through science and there will be something else uh, that is not science. If so, then if you were living 300 years ahead, how would you call us? How would you call the moment we are living in? Because you, you were saying rena rena renaissance, right? Renaissance there. And uh, three, 300 years ahead, uh, what would we be? You said three questions. Okay. Confirm the okay. the transition. Yeah. Uh, what is after science? Okay. And okay, right. uh, what would would you call us? Hmm. You know, it, it it's uh, <clears throat> it's very dangerous to sort of uh, argue periods in history, and you know, to some extent we do it to help us make sense of it, right? But, uh, but historians will always argue about the edges of periods. So, so I do use it in a way to make sense of things. And, and I do feel like there is, a, there is a particular quality to the present. And I, I say that being fully aware that every generation has this conceit. <laughs> Every generation feels like now is this special moment. But, um, but there, are some, uh, there are some macro, I think, uh, there's some macro evidence that, that it is true uh, in our time. Uh, so, you know, the advent of the digital age, um, the, the advent of computers have, I guess to relate to science, give this present moment really, you know, sort of since the 1950s to today, um, a very different quality to the past. Um, and, you know, just for example, um, you know, if we look at, you know, any of the research that happens in a, a university like this, I mean, the computers, computers are, are more important to astronomy than the telescope ever was, uh, more important to biology than the microscope ever was. More important to physics, I argue, more important to physics than the particle accelerator ever was. Because, you know, with computers, we have this instrument that can discern signal from noise. 
with uh, a, a fidelity that no optical instrument was ever able to achieve. And that's really important for our science. Um, so, and I could go on and talking about, you know, certain transitions that we've made in, you know, urbanization. We're now an urban species, uh, you know, talking about climate change. I mean, you know, we're seeing things in the climate that we haven't seen since Neolithic days. Right? So there's a lot to argue that this is a, a, a particular moment in history. Um, in terms of, and, and so I fully take the point, and you know, it is very interesting how uh, you know, the history of science, and certainly you know, 500 years ago, if we said science, no one had any idea what we meant by that. Um, natural philosophy was about as close as, as they got. Um, but the scientific method really didn't you know, come until until Bacon. And yet, it's interesting that, you know, when we look back 500 years to history, it's, it's you know, through our scientific lens, uh, it's the science that we remember best. If we did a survey of, you know, what do people know about the European Renaissance? You know, very few people would be able to describe the the political transformations underway, you know, what happened in Tudor England and stuff. It's not in the public consciousness at all. We remember Copernicus. Uh, we remember um, da Vinci, you know, and we remember some of the art because it's still with us. Um, and in terms of 300 years from now, I kind of suspect that it is, again, the science that people will remember best. I really don't think 300 years from now people are going to talk about Donald Trump at all. Yeah, I hope not too. But also, I mean, if I think of titanic political shocks, with maybe Martin Luther's Reformation is the one exception, but other titanic political shocks that, from a European perspective 500 years ago, that no one, you'd have to be a historian to know that they happened today. Um, and I think it'll be the same in the far future. They'll look back at you know, the 21st century and they'll talk about the first line in the history books will be the advent of the internet, I think without question. Right? And then it'll probably be, you know, we'll talk about artificial intelligence, and we'll talk about Weber's research. Right? That's the stuff that I think history is going to remember because of uh, how powerfully our science is taking off right now. So I think that we will look upon it as sort of uh, the dawn of science, actually. I mean, since, since it's Friday afternoon, I might as well sort of throw academic caution to the wind. I think there's a real argument to be made that, that this is the dawn of civilization in terms of what we are capable of doing now, the questions we're capable of researching now. I mean, there's a real argument to be made that you know, the 20th, 20th century sounds amazing. Yeah, we, you know, we couldn't fly, and now we could. Um, you know, combustion engine, electricity. But uh, in some ways, that was all easy stuff. We found oil in the ground. We can burn it, convert it to electricity. You know, now we have the tools to really start going after uh, the hard questions. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, with a bit more over time, we're going to appreciate how this was the moment when, when, in the real sense, science began, when we had computers as our scientific instruments. Questions? Uh... Hello, my name is Luciana. I'm a student here at UST. And uh, you talk about growth economists. Then you talk about uh, redefine what pro progress and prosperity is. So my question is, do you think that we're also going to change from our obsession to GDP growth to start uh, looking at prosperity, incorporating like climate change or di biodiversity uh, loss, all these other elements that um, we as a, we don't count when we count progress nowadays. We just count growth 2% uh, of the year or and things like that. You know what I, mean? um, I hope so. I hope so. And uh, I, think we ha I think we have to. Uh, well, what I'm seeing, uh, maybe the first thing I'm seeing is 
to some extent, we're, I think we're reaching the limits of the growth lens as a helpful model. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I often try to take inspiration from biology on these questions. I mean, I was in Australia two weeks ago. <clears throat> we're talking about the Great Barrier Reef and the bleaching that is taking place there. You know, the, the goal of the Great Barrier Reef is not to grow to encompass the whole planet, right? It's about sustainability within a certain ecological niche. Um, and, you know, in a lot of domains of society today, uh, I think we're starting to see the, the limits of uh, the growth perspective. Um, so let me give a, a business example. Um, since I do a lot of, a lot of my, my research is in, is in uh, economics and political economy. Um, do you use Twitter? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter too. Twitter's great, right? Really handy, neat little tool. There are some weird politicians on it, admittedly. Um, <clears throat> great tool. On Wall Street, it's considered a failure. Right? Why is that? Because when it went public, uh, you know, investors put about $50 billion into Twitter, right? And we expect 100 times return on our investment, right? So Twitter makes $2 billion a year. That's not enough to fulfill my growth expectations, right? So we've taken a, a perfectly good and useful, profitable device that, that, that fits in a certain niche, right? Has a certain utility. But from a growth perspective, it's, it's a failure, right? Um, and that's just one example, but they're everywhere, right? To say nothing of, you know, all of the uh, environmental consequences of, you know, a growth agenda. And, you know, now we have so much data uh, of the, um, the externalities, right, that need to be brought into our economic model. Actually, you know, GDP... Well, we all know that you know, this, all sorts of history books have been written on what it was originally designed for. It has a wartime history. It was never meant to be a proxy uh, for general social progress. Right? Um, and so I think maybe this is me being optimistic. I think there's a growing recognition of that. I think that there are interesting uh, efforts being made to have a, a broader definition, whether it's um, you know, the UN Human Development Index, uh, whether it's some private sector attempts to sort of have a sustainable economic development index. I mean, there are various efforts underway. Um, but uh, I think there's still a, a big step sort of politically and socially, and also for us in the academy, to create a compelling alternative to really move us beyond it. Thank you. My name is Lisette Barlach, and I'm a professor here at the university. Um, I would like to just make a comment about uh, your three questions. You pose three questions. And the second of it, uh, of them, is find your Florence. When you, you, when you said that, it immediately came to my mind, Silicon Valley. It was something that came to my mind. Let's say, do we have Silicon Valley as our Florence in this uh, age, right? But um, then uh, I just remember a sentence or a book from uh, Bauman, Bauman, Zygmunt Bauman, mm. uh, about the li liquid modernity. And so we don't need a place. We, uh, <laughs> the concept of a place compared to virtual reality is, uh, uh, is something that we can question today. Nowadays, do we need a place? <laughs> and so um, I'm uh, kind of discussing your second, uh, uh, your sec second question, right? Uh, about what is the need of the place, right? Mm. Uh, I, I think it's an excellent question. And uh, I mean, honestly, I think that we're, we're grappling with this question. I think there are two sides to it um, because, you know, on the one hand, there are so many examples of uh, work 
you know, creative work, you know, impactful changes that have happened by people who've never met, right? So, so it is possible uh, for minds to meet in cyberspace and to make things happen. Right? Um, and yet, you know, challenging that is also a recognition that, um, and I think we've all experienced this, you know, relationships with other people, projects that we have, can seem to accelerate when we are physically present to one another. And, and part of it is just scheduling, right? I mean, when we're physically present, then we make each other a priority, and whatever it is that we share, we, we sp invest a lot more time and energy into it than when we're sort of virtually putting in a little bit here and there. Um, but I do also think that an important aspect of this is, is to, to recognize that um, not everything uh, can be digitized. Uh, you know, so you know, my example with Jorge, like, you know, I, I wrote a, a best-selling book last year. I still don't even know how it became a bestseller. Right? So I can't, and I've never, I've certainly never written down how I think I did that, but you know, come and talk to me afterwards and I'll, I'll tell you what I know. Right, and there's a lot of uh, of uh, experiential knowledge uh, that that you know, we just don't have time to codify to digitize. We're actually getting better at that. So here we are, and while we are having this conversation in the room, we're also you know making it digital and sharing it with an online community. So so that's good. We're we're learning that every time we physically get together, maybe there's something valuable that we need to be sharing. Right, but I still think that there's a lot that isn't digital, isn't shared, and so in the meantime, until we figure out how to perfectly digitize what's important to our research works, we, we need to get together. Uh, there are interesting points uh, on your question, and I think we 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 touched some of these issues uh, early this morning. Um, we had a huge amount of information dispersed out there, right? So, and we should question ourselves as faculty or scientists, as society, do we really need to be uh, closer to each other? Uh, it's kind of a, or what is our role as a faculty or a scientist with our students and our colleagues? Do we need to be, <laughs> to have this bond or this connection? And I, I think the question is probably yes, <laughs> because this still makes sense, otherwise, uh, of course, we, we are discussing the nature of jobs, uh, the nature, the future jobs or em employment, um, the issues of um, place to be. And I think uh, th that are, there is the truth of um, holding people together and the concentration of, uh, let's say, um, uh, efforts towards an, an ecosystem that makes sense. This is why probably Silicon Valley <laughs> is it's a case I wouldn't say a success only, but also a case of gathering people like uh, some places in, in Boston area in terms of biotech or in terms of development in other places. And I'm, I'm not sure about if we, uh, the roles that we'll have to think in terms of future of the university in terms of how we'll continue to, uh, to, to do science uh, and as a fundamental questions and what type of science we need, what type of questions we need to ask uh, ourselves for the future of our students. If we're going digital 100%, we need to be present all the time in classes. And, and I don't know, it's, uh, there are a lot of uh, questions uh, about these issues. And anyway, and, and if I can just add on that, uh, I mean, one of the reasons why I think this is such an important question, and I really don't think we have the answer, but it's an important question because uh, it has real ethical and equity implications. Right? If, if being there makes a difference, right? not everyone can be there. Right? Presence is an advantage. Right? So there is, at, at the heart of, you know, especially at sort of the birth of the internet, there was this democratizing, equalizing notion. Right? That we all have equal access. If that's not sociologically true, right, if there is an advantage to physical presence, then there's an equity issue about access to being physically present. 
because the location is a scarce resource. We can't all be here physically present in this room. So who gets to be here in this room if there's an advantage to that, right? Uh, uh, well, uh, regarding finding Florence, uh, <laughs> ah, uh, Andres Saito from the Brazilian Knowledge Management Society. My pleasure. Uh, your talk about tacit knowledge made a lot of sense to me. We, we study tacit knowledge a lot. And uh, uh, I see that uh, uh, besides the experiential knowledge, we also talk about a collective knowledge which is shared understanding, shared practices that makes this ecosystem dynamics uh, work. So uh, 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 it makes sense, this dependence of, of the, the, the place. But, uh, well, I individually can find my Florence and move there, but we as a society cannot move <laughs> elsewhere. So. Uh, how can we find our Florences and uh, foster our Florences so we can be a part of uh, the, this renaissance? I, I think that's an excellent question, and, and it's one that we all need to be asking, right? Especially if we have, I mean, if I take on, a, a, a say, a, a civic leadership role or an organizational leadership role, uh, yeah, my, my task is not to find Florence, but how do I re-raise it here? You know, again, and this is, you know, to the extent that we believe that this tacit knowledge is sort of a, a key part of what sort of stirs the drink, right? Or it's the secret ingredient. Then how do we create that pool? And there are different models. Like Silicon Valley was, you know, a big pool of government cash. Boom, right? Big pool of government cash. And, and you see that happening uh, in China, for example. You know, so we want to develop a domestic aerospace industry. We think long term there's a strategic advantage to doing that. Well, how do we do that? Big pool of cash. Boom. Right? And that pool of cash is like a gravity well. Right? Brings the research, brings the technology, brings the engineers, and eventually it kind of takes on a life of its own and pulls more people into its orbit. But what if that's not an option that's available? Right? So I was, again, a couple of weeks ago in Australia, Melbourne and Sydney, talking about exactly this issue. Right? Here we are in a world where uh, people, talent, capital, increasingly mobile. Right? And here in Australia, you know, we've got a lot of good things going for us, but we are also very far away from a lot of centers. So there's a kind of distance penalty. Or is there? That's our question. That's our fear. And you know, we don't have the resources of the Chinese government to say, oh, we're going to create you know, a global hub for this. Right? So then it becomes a, a challenge. Well, how, how do we pull people in? Maybe it's our uh, expatriate community, which is very far flung, and creating you know, like interpersonal relationships that way. Right? Or how? Policy preferences. Yeah, just to illustrate this, um, uh, we take it for granted that um, Boston is a center of uh, excellence of different areas. Um, just a month ago, the, um, the local government, the state of Massachusetts, decided to create a new policy to continue to foster biotech companies. And they're putting uh, around a couple billion dollars there. And say, <coughs> is there a need to do it more in a place which has the largest number of startups in biotech in the world, uh, the vast resources from all these schools? And they said, for innovation, for creating, to continue this pathway of growth, of uh, knowledge, we need to continue to support the initial steps of, of infant companies or ideas that would be transformed into companies, real companies. So we need this additional couple of billion dollars. <laughs> uh, so anyway, just uh, to, to think about it. I, I would also just briefly add, I think that uh, this is an area where um, good, creative, uh, innovative policymaking and leadership can really make a difference. Uh, lots of examples. Um, you know, how do you become a hub for global flow? So, you know, about, I guess, 20 years ago, uh, Amsterdam had this idea that the internet is going to need interconnection points. And we're going to create policy preferences so that those European interconnection points happen here. And today, Amsterdam, if you look at just the backbone network of the internet, major global hub, right? 
and also now you have all sorts of uh, fintech firms, like financial tech firms, locating in Amsterdam. Why? Because milliseconds matter, right? When you're doing high frequency trading, we need to be near the hub. Right? Uh, smaller example, oh, I come from Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. You know, population 200,000 people. You look at a map, it's like, you know, the center of North America. You know, it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but, you know, 10 years ago, policymakers said, you know what, hey, if we're in the middle of nowhere, it means we're an equal distance from everywhere. And that can be useful for logistics. And so they built an inland transit hub. So trains, buses, they come to that inland terminal, and you know the, the train loads gets moved onto the truck loads, and it's developing into sort of a northern North American transit hub, and then creating industry around that. So good creative policy leadership. There is a lot to be done. How can we attract flows? The goods, capital, people, services, ideas. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I was going to make a comment uh, uh, on, on the, these issues of the university and your question especially. The fact is that uh, California is there, right? The Silicon Valley is there and it will continue there. Regina will continue there, right? It invented something and it became, it detached from the average. Uh, scientifically, I think a good explanation for that is how biology works. Networks. Every cell of every every cell of every one of us here works. The metabolism works with hierarchic networks. You cannot have uh, a cell functioning or many other systems functioning with a, with a random network. So you have to have a hub, and and it has to have a place. If it has two or three places, it could be California plus X and Y, but still you will have to, to fabricate a uh, hierarchy, right? Like hap it happened to your book, right? I, th I, I don't know how, I don't know if, if we could have a sort of democracy or something like this one day that will be a random network. I think that would be very boring and uh, uh, probably wouldn't work. Uh, speaking about the university, we are fragmented now, and the university became, at least ours, became so boring that the society is saying that we, we, we don't serve for anything, right? Because we, 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 we don't have these aisles, we don't have, the, the network is completely fragmented because of uh, this idea of uh, uh, wanting that Science is democracy. Science is not democracy. Science leads to, if you apply well science, you have a much better democracy. But science doesn't need to be democracy. Science has to have tipping points, things that are really important and people have to see and use that. Right? Even if it's a new idea like in Regina, but you, you just found your place. But it, it, it is, in fact, uh, you became a hub, like you were saying, right? And a hub is a high centrality in the network. Well, uh, just uh, lots of uh, ideas and, and things uh, about uh, our roles uh, that we should play, especially here at the Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, that should be uh, besides a think tank of the roles that the university should play to the society, especially a public university like the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, what I would like to hear from you, Chris, is uh, we've met in the first time in Oxford in a conference about circular economy. Um, I would like to, to, uh, to ask you about your views about to what extent the fundamentals of circular economy, which are several, and it's basically uh, almost a definition of something that it is beyond sustainability. Uh, do you think uh, the new pathways towards prosperity, um, how that relates to 
the principles or fundamentals of circular economy. If you could just... Uh, and maybe... Um, reflect you know, to, about this. And, and to reflect off of your comments as well. I, I, what... <clears throat> you know, sometimes we're guided by intuitions. And what intuitively I find so compelling about um, the, sort of the, uh, the idea framework of the circular economy and the shift from linear to circular is that it seems to me to be a shift from you know, mechanistic to more biological models for society. And, you know, set aside the academic research, just intuitively that feels powerfully right to me. Um, it, it's also why, you know, why I, I, I see the, I guess, the close affinity between, you know, this shift towards thinking of a circular economy uh, and my thinking that, you know, this moment we're in is kind of like a second renaissance is uh, because of this sort of shift away from the mechanical, from the mechanistic. Um, I get into a lot of uh, debates about, you know, you know, does history happen in periods, and what period is this? You know, is this a second renaissance? Is this a fourth industrial revolution? I get, I get that a lot. Is this another industrial revolution? And... Uh, I hate the lens of industrial revolution uh, for two reasons. One, I think that it's too mechanistic. It's too mechanistic a lens to focus our attention on where stuff is happening uh, in the present. And then two, it's, it, it focuses too much on technology, whereas I think the real transformations that have to take place uh, are in society. Uh, are in our, our values frameworks and our judging frameworks. Uh, and this is really what, you know, if you sort of, you know, look into the, <coughs> the different tenets of, of a circular economy, where, where it's also trying to go, right? Um, and so, yeah, my, I guess my, my first broad response, I'm happy to kind of take it deeper if you want to follow up, um, is that I, I see it as inviting us to... Yeah, be more inspired by biological models in thinking about how we organize society. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your a very good presentation. Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask you. Sorry, your name is Luis. Sorry, Luis. my name is Luis from uh, Fundação Instituto de Administração here in São Paulo. Uh, the sec the first um, Renaissance, the man was in the middle of that as you show us the Vitruvian man from Da Vinci. In your opinion, who is the center of this so-called second renaissance? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I guess uh, humanity is always at the middle, right? And you know, maybe that's uh, a kind of uh, a broader point a broader theme that I'm often trying to bring out um, is <coughs> how much, I mean, we are in the driver's seat here, right? Um, we, we tend to, we. But, the, but do you think we're in the driver's seat? What, what I mean by that is, <laughs> what I mean by that Just a, is. Or should we? Yeah. <laughs> what, I, what I mean by that is, uh, I think there are, there are several uh, examples in sort of society today where we treat as exogenous, as external, something over which we have uh, a much more central role to play. Um, globalization is maybe one example, right? And I'm not sure how it translates into Portuguese. In English, you know, globalization, whenever we add ization, onto a word, we're saying this is a process, right? And a process is just something that happens at us, right? It would be irrational to oppose a process, right? 
Um, you know, fast forward to 2015, 2016, and you have, you know, essentially the collapse of globalization because you have uh, some of the key players saying, we don't like the outcomes of this process. When actually, it was, it was framed from the start incorrectly. Right? It's, not a, it's not a process, some economic inevitability. Right? It's a, an economic technology about opening up and trade, uh, but also a political ism about you know, how the gains and losses ought to be distributed. Right? But those two were never clearly separated because we use this word globalization. Right. And by talking about this process rather than this ism, we, we didn't invite the kind of public discourse that along the way maybe would have had more participation in thinking about the gains and the losses, the winners and the losers. Right. So, you know, now today, uh, I, I feel like there are areas where we're making that mistake again. You know, automation, as if you know, the robots and the AI just falls from the sky. Well, no, it doesn't just fall from the sky. We, we create technological trends. Um, and, and granted, it's hard at an individual level to think about, well, how could it develop any other way? Um, but like we were discussing this morning, I mean, and I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist or anything, but, you know, follow the money. And if we look at the U.S., for example, you know, two-thirds of all R&D is still military, right? And, and what, what is the technological goal of the military? It's to replace human combatants with robot combatants, basically. And we have drones in the sky, right? Um, and we have increasingly autonomous machines. Well, just like, you know, the moonshot 50 years ago, created technology that we then commercialized in the public, you know, now, after 20, 30 years of developing autonomy for the military, surprise, surprise, we have increasingly autonomous machines in our factories and on our streets, right? This, this didn't just happen. This is a research direction that we've been investing in. Now, to what extent does society recognize that there have been choices being made here along the way. Ah, I, I would submit to a very small extent, right? <laughs> and, and, and so to your question, you know, what's at the center? I would like to argue that, that we need to be uh, at the center. And God, if there was ever a better time to make an impassioned argument for the role of the academy, right? This, this is what the academy is for. You know, in these moments where there are deep implications, right? the implications of synthetic biology, for example, are profound. And as a society, we need to develop the capacity to have discourse about what it means to, to, to put the power to create life and modify life in human hands. Right? And you know, we're not talking about this nearly enough. We're not talking about the problem that, you know, absent some global compact, different countries are going to uh, experiment and develop these technologies at different speeds in different ways. You know, China's pretty aggressively working at synthetic, you know, genetic manipulation of the human organism, you know, for, you know, how do we, you know, fight cancer and things like this. Right? So my argument would be that we, we have to be at the center of this moment that for, in many ways, whether it's economic, globalization, technology, automation, we've, we've uh, been excluded or maybe we've ceded that, that central role. Uh, somehow we've got to get it back. And I think that the academy has an indispensable role to play to help take these things and make them accessible to a wider public so that we can play a role. I do believe that Thank you. this is... Uh, true uh, in the very asymmetric world that we're living in. I mean, if uh, that would be easy to say for some particular context, but not for, for the average, I would say, as we discuss uh, guys sitting in Africa 
or a guy that is sitting outside, I see the, this process of being in the driver's seat. Uh, or how, how do you account this? Uh, although we are living a sort of the world that we are living better, we are living longer, so we have new drugs and we have uh, a little bit of food security, probably with a certain risks, but is this true for everybody or is this uh, holding true for, uh, for, for us? You know, uh, I mean, great question. And all I can, and I don't have answers to these questions, all I can suggest is the problem of, you know, so many of us feel like the, 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 we just, we can't possibly shape <laughs> the way the world is going, right? It's just the complexity defeats us, uh, the scale defeats us. And um, the first answer to that problem that comes to mind, uh, believe it or not, is the politicians. <laughs> I, knew, I knew I'd get some laughs from that. What I mean by that, and, and, you know, and there are all sorts of questions, political questions, institutional questions, but um, you know, the culture that I come from in Canada, uh, to be a career politician is a bad thing. Right? It's kind of a, a, a derogatory term you know, to spend your life doing politics. Um, but at least, and I, I won't speak to the political tradition here in Brazil, but I think in Canada... Please don't. You know, well, just, you know, I, you know, I know what I don't know, dare. and I know what don't I don't dare. know. And, um, but, yeah. But I think that in, in Canada, for example, we actually need to rehabilitate the political class and see, we you too. know, a career politician is a good thing. That we have people who spend the time to understand the complexities of, for example, healthcare policy, understand the complexities of, you know, technology policy and, you know, sort of take advantage of the possibilities of representative democracy and say, no, I don't understand these things. I got to make a good choice, a values choice, but do I trust the character of this person? But then have career politicians who my tax dollars pay to spend the time to try to make good decisions, to advocate good decisions on the public's behalf. I feel like that could be the solution to help us to, to feel like we have a greater say over the world we live in. Now, I understand, I'm not naive, there are all sorts of agency problems uh, with that. And there are all sorts of problems with the time horizons of political campaigns and the implications of all of that. So we gotta work that stuff out too. But we do have, one of the things that separates the, the first renaissance from the second is we've got this new powerful technology called representative democracy. Uh, and I do think that it's gonna be an important part of how we navigate through this stuff. Uh, I'll make a comment I would like to, you to comment on it is uh, about climate change. Uh, the uh, virus 21, uh, uh, asked the IPCC to write a special report. I'm one of the authors now of this report. Is the 1.5 warming word? So the question is, what is going to happen? Are we? Are we? What can we do to avoid uh, passing 1.5, going over 1.5? And then you talk to <coughs> Paulo Artacho, for example, and to the guys, the climatologists. They say, forget it. We are going towards 2.7. I don't know if, if in the course you wow. were, we are going towards 2.7 no matter what we do because we already passed the point of no return. Uh, so, but we keep thinking that uh, we, we have to come up with options and I would like you to comment on what options we have to keep on the, uh, I don't know if you know the, the, so, the, the socioeconomic pathways, the SSPs, right, the SSP1 going going towards sustainability or going towards where Trump is leading us, that is the rivalry, the national rivalry, there are scenarios for all that. So then the, the dilemma that I, I just discussed with Paolo uh, in, in Skype is, Paolo says the only way we could avoid going over two degrees 
is with a very strong geoengineering. Mm. Geoengineering is something that is really complicated because it's a single experiment with all of us. If it doesn't work, we are doomed. The other, way, the, the other way to go is to find something that I don't know what it is that will, will be politics, will be a way to make people all over the world, even the, you, you, you comment on the people that are in Africa, but remember that 50% of the British voted Brexit because they don't feel globalized. Right? And probably the 50% that vote to Trump also don't feel globalized. I don't know if I'm wrong with that. So we have this dilemma. Either we deal with people, with the brain, with society, and we develop very quickly technologies that could put people to work together, or we do bioengineering. Or where, where do we go? You, you, said, uh, you said that you, you foresaw the Brexit and... Uh, Right? Uh, how did you do that? I would like you to comment how, wh what led you to, to go to that way. Was it a coincidence or, or you had reason, scientific reasons to think about it? Or the third option to reduce uh, the option of going up from 1.5 degrees would be the crisis that we had in 2008, economic crisis that was uh, responsible for reducing greenhouse gases at the level of the Kyoto targets. The 2008 crisis, uh, economic crisis, the global that we suffered, was equal to all the targets that we had assumed for the Kyoto Protocol uh, itself. Anyway. So we, we have, we have the, now what people are saying, uh, what we get in the report, is that we are going to have to spend, if we spend now, if we act now, we need to, uh, to spend a hundred trillion dollars. If we don't, we, and, and, and we allow it to go after 2030, we are going to spend $500 trillion. So it's, it's a very, very, very complicated situation. I come back to my first question. So what, what are we going to be seeing in the future? So how do we solve climate change? Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, yeah, right, easy questions. Um, well, briefly, you know, so how... As a political scientist, you know, um, and, and how to predict Trump and Brexit, that's, that's a far easier question to answer. Because um, as a political scientist, you know, in, in writing my book, and sort of looking at what's our pair, what's a, what's a lens for making sense of things? Uh, one thing that I was able to do was, you know, recognize the, the analytic frame that so much political science was stuck in for the past few years. Um, and, and, and so, you know, as, as, as scientists, but maybe I'll just speak as political scientists, um, you know, you don't actually look at all the data. You have a hypothesis about the world. And, and so you, you look at this data that's relevant and you delete the rest. Right? And in 2015, you could pretty from my lens, sort of, you know, the Renaissance lens, it seemed pretty clear to me that a lot of the data that as a discipline we were deleting was data about the, the social stresses, right? That there are these revolutions taking place in science and economy. I wish I'd met you three years ago. I could have a far more intelligent book then. Um, you know, there... There's these revolutions taking place in society, in business, in economics, in science, uh, but our political institutions evolve far more slowly. And so there's this stress accumulating, and you can see it in public discontent that you, like these institutions aren't helping me keep up with the world I live in. And when you start to look for the data to support that, there's actually a lot of data. You know, you could look in the uh, US income statistics and see the stagnation you know, in the broad middle class in their real incomes over the past 20 years. Um, and at the bottom levels of income, like the, sort of the, the bottom decile, it's staggering. That you know, if, you, if you are a, a bottom decile American by income, you were better off, you were making more money in real terms in 1990 
when the overall economy was 60% the size it is today. And so you just do the thought experiment. How would I feel right, to be present to this broad economic growth and I'm actually worse off in absolute terms? Right? You can very quickly start to construct a cable. There's a lot of social angst here. And so when I'm watching uh, Trump's presidential campaign, from my data set, I'm thinking there are a lot of people who feel like they're being heard for the first time. This, this loyalty narrative that he's got going which is to say, you know, these politicians who are talking about climate change, they're disloyal. They're saying that this big, broad, future, abstract risk is more important than your economic now. Right? I'm saying that I hear you. And, and my hypothesis is that that's going to win votes. Now, you know, because of the narrowness of the victory, and the Russia implication, who knows? You know, when, when the victory is that, when the margin of victory is that small, uh, every factor becomes relevant. Um, so I'm not saying that it was a, a grand theory to explain it, but I was looking for the stressors. Um, I, so I, climate change scares me um, because I feel like this is, uh, this is the test that, uh, that, that, that the, the form of governance that I was raised in wasn't built to address. But, you know, so my form of governance, representative democracy with four to five year election cycles was built around the problem of corruption, the corruption of power, and the need to have good governance that is not invested in a single person but is invested in an institution. And that's what the technology of you know, electoral democracy solves. Um, and you know, there's all of this game theory that makes it very difficult to align administration after administration on these you know, very immediate and present action required now, but rather uh, diffuse and hard to see threats. So I'm just worried. That, I'm worried for my governance technology vis-a-vis -vis this threat and whether it's going to, how it's going to cope, how it's going to cope. And you understand the risks better than I do. Uh, this, you understand the severity of the risk better than I do. So how do you sleep at night? Um, I do think that, um, you know, there's going to be pretty significant adaptation either way. And so, you know, one big thing that I'm working on is thinking about social resiliency. How do we be, build resiliency in our societies? The assumption being that not just climate shocks, but the shocks in general, financial shocks, other economic shocks, pandemic shocks, uh, are going to come faster and stronger as time goes on because of the, the concentrations and the complexities that we're building in pretty much every system, not just our environmental or climate system, our infrastructure systems, our, our digital systems, cyberspace. Our, our, you know, cyberspace, and on and on and on and on. Right. So I'm, I'm concerned about that, and, and you know, so my contribution is trying to help them think about the resiliency question, social resiliency, um, yeah, systemic resiliency, and how do, we, how do we build that? That's one of my research questions. <laughs> well, I'm, I, we are almost about the time that we need to close, unfortunately. Um, and I think um, we have a lot of, uh, let's say, um, issues to think and to bring back home and to our labs and to our groups and to our um, yeah, stakeholders that we're interacting. Again, I'm very pleased to... Um, to have uh, Chris here has been a pleasure. We will continue these discussions, I'm sure. Um, and I would like to thank um, the Institute for hosting us. Professor Marcus uh, was here also uh, for the participation with his projects, ideas, and, and energy. And to all of you who had attended uh, this session. And I would like to pass the word to Professor Adi for the final remarks. A uh, few remarks. The first one is obviously that 
uh, you are wrong. Not you have to thank us. We have to thank you, both Chris, for coming and making a real, very, uh, very enriching, uh, enriching uh, contribution and that will be uh, seen not only by heard by whoever is here, but will be uh, seen and heard uh, uh, later on. And uh, it was really very good. You uh, you uh, enriched, I, I would say, uh, our mental maps and our thought destinations, which I think is exactly the role that we have in this institute. So thank you again very, very much for coming. And thank you, uh, uh, dear Weber, for uh, finding uh, uh, the a way of bringing Chris to to the institutes. I think I think I speak on on behalf of everybody. I would like before making the, uh, some final uh, thanks just to make uh, uh, two uh, remarks. One about what I heard, and one about uh, really two about what I heard, but one more general and one more specific in, about about us. Uh, all things that uh, that were presented here, uh, uh, I think one that just struck my mind is the issue that was mentioned that we are in the driver's seat. Now, in this age, especially in the age of autonomous vehicles, what does it mean to be in a driver's seat? <laughs> the seats that count probably are the seats of the programmers of the not only the programmers of the vehicle, but programmers of the si designers of the system, of who gets priority, who uh, uh, who uh, uh, comes uh, around, who has to be stopped, uh, what the tolls are, the system. So I think that uh, of maybe we also will begin to have to think in different terms of uh, models, mental models of of who is really the driver. Maybe we think we are the drivers, but we are driven. And uh, who designs the roads that allow us to go somewhere? And maybe another final question is who entices us to go somewhere? Who brings some ideas that make me leave the beautiful winter in Saskatchewan and go somewhere and not only stay Obviously at my... you've never been to Saskatchewan winter No, I, <laughs> I'm just uh, kidding. Yeah, thank you. Anyhow, so uh, that, that is a general, uh, uh, I would say, speculation. Uh, the more specific is I, 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 uh, it's just to uh, piggyback on your comments that uh, I agree totally that I agree in this institute we agree that uh, the university has to do something with regard to building a new political uh, uh, yeah I mean breathe this good good point good to have like here uh, to make uh, especially in Brazil I, I may say uh, the idea of being a professional politician or public policy maker less derog derogatory. And, and so we are trying to begin, uh, we will begin uh, second semester, but probably beginning of next year, a project to take young fellows, kind of ending undergraduate a bit more, and having them for some time around with basically uh, three uh, items uh, in the agenda. One, is really some basics about, well, I think that you said about political systems, etc., etc. Give some more fundamental knowledge. Uh, second, use the fact that the university is uh, full of people with different uh, knowledge. So, if if the issue is to take something which is very dear, especially to Professor Bukerich, uh, the issue of uh, what resources is relevant? Uh, is a person once probably in his political, future political, public, public policy maker career enters this, to use the time and to have different uh, contact with different approaches in the university. So, 
So uh, that's the second one. And the third one is to use, uh, again, the, the remains of the credibility that the university still has, if I may, and, uh, and uh, bring here people from this area so these young people can interact and see how the world is really doing. So let's talk to the state secretary of, of water resources, who, by the way, is a faculty member of the Polytechnic School, by the way, and, and stay sometimes there. And so we hope to, to, to kind of begin an inbreeding of a new, uh, of a new class or group or that may, yeah, cohort may begin uh, changing the world. As you said, it begins with Gutenberg in the beginning with one book, but uh, after some time, and by coincidence, yesterday appeared uh, in Nature, I think, or a few days ago, that uh, Mr. George Church wrote a book called Regenesis, which has 90, 90 billion copies, because it was, he put it in the DNA of a bacteria, and that was obviously multiplied, so it's 90 billion copies. He says it's the most published book yeah, in the world, not read, but published. And uh, anyhow, so uh, I think, uh, again, what, what you talked, uh, what you presented us is not only uh, thoughts and history and you're brilliant in that, but also you brought us here and there uh, items for an agenda for the university. And so we are very thankful to, to you for your presentation. Uh, I will uh, end by thanking uh, not only you, but the questions, the questions that were made by you that enriched the, the conversations. That's the role of this room, and this room is, has a, the, the place is very important. So the way this place is set out so is that you feel a little bit more uh, in, a, in a living room than in a traditional class uh, where you have somebody standing and <coughs> and the other people sitting like uh, in the traditional way, uh, kind of below and hearing only. Uh, so thank you very much for, to, to all the questions and, 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 and comments that were raised. Second, uh, second uh, uh, thank you obviously very much for Sandra, who is our, our uh, angel who organizes these meetings, and for Sergio and Georgi, who are sitting there, who are responsible for uh, bringing uh, this um, uh, uh, so beautiful moments uh, for uh, uh, perennity, as long as the technology is still around, that we can hear and read uh, and see what happened. And uh, I think, uh, as my, my colleague, uh, Paulo Saldiva, uses an expression that I think it's... Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, the counterfact of what uh, Professor Bukovic mentioned. He, say, he used to say, and I, I agree, that in many venues at university, you come out more uh, tired and bored and uh, than when you entered. But here, you come out better than how you began the afternoon. So thank you for making our afternoon better, our day better, and you are always very welcome here. Thank you so much. May I, may I briefly respond to a couple of them? Uh, so, uh, and, and then I'll shut up, I promise. Um, so first of all, um, the, the program that you described uh, about, about sort of you know, creating the next political class sounds so important, and, and I look forward to seeing how that story evolves. Um, second, just in terms of you know, the agenda and the role of the university, you know, it's very interesting. If you look at sort of the last 250 years uh, of uh, like, uh, technological change, how important a role universities play. Um, so, you know, after the first, industri the first Industrial Revolution, a lot of confusion about steam power and the applications of this and how it's going to transform society. Um, and out of that confusion came the very first engineering schools in the 1780s, which basically got the, the mechanics and the scientists and the philosophers in a room together to step back and create a new discipline to take this confusion and to kind of reach a new level of abstraction where it all made sense. Um, 
know, then in the 1880s, you know, when you had the sort of really the birth of mass manufacturing, you know, fueled by oil, fueled by electricity, um, you know, businesses, industrialists had a problem that like just the assets and the debts and the cash flows were so huge that accountants didn't know what to do with the money, right? And so the story goes that um, an industrialist, John Wharton, went to his friend, the president of the University of Pennsylvania, and said, build me a better accountant. And here's $100,000 to do it with. And they got together, the accountants and the economists and the physicists, and they came up with finance, this new discipline called finance in the first business schools. You know, the computer revolution in the 50s and the 60s, you know, IBM, and they're building these new technologies, and we're dealing with numbers and calculations of a scale we've never dealt with before. And so at Stanford, they got together the, you know, the scientists, the computer technicians, and again, the philosophers, right? And they created this new discipline called computer science, right? So engineering, finance, computer science. You know, we could, the modern world could not, we could not handle it without these disciplines. And each developed in response to uh, a new technology that was just sort of sweeping through society and creating all these complexities. So I think that you, the university, sector, the academy, is going to have to do that again. Right? You know, maybe it'll be autonomy sciences, as you think about who is in the driver's seat. And we're going to have to get together the computer scientists, yeah, but also the philosophers. It's great to think that there's going to be more jobs for philosophers in the future uh, and help us to feel less overwhelmed by some of these technological possibilities and more of a sense of, okay, well, here's a research agenda. And here's how we, how we sort through these problems. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's why I'm an academic, is I strongly believe that we have a role to play in the world today. Um, and, and it has been, uh, this morning and now this afternoon, uh, just a, a fabulous day for me. Uh, and my first day here in Brazil to have spent it here in Sao Paulo, the University of Sao Paulo, here at the Institute for Advanced Studies with you, uh, I'm certainly walking out of this day uh, with a lot more energy, which is amazing since I'm under the weather. Uh, and so I thank you all for the warm invitation. Thank you, Weber, for uh, engineering the possibility of me being here. Uh, thank you, Professor Marcus, for your energy and, and everyone here. It's been a thorough pleasure, so thank you very much. We hope you have found your florists. <laughs> well, the weather is right, let me tell you that. Well.